Welcome to the High Dimensional uh, Neural Dynamic Field Lecture, um, which is our first step towards uh, what you will see is, is higher cognition. So we remind you again what our core mechanisms in dynamic field theory are. Remember, you know, fields are defined over low dimensional metric spaces. Um, and uh, they, they receive input that reflects these spaces that's typically localized and there's, there's localized input here leads to a peak and then they have these uh, strong patterns of interaction local excitatory global inhibitory that makes for peaks selection decisions detection decisions working memory and so on and and so all of those these instabilities that support these compositions all come from the interaction within the field. So when you're varying the dimension of a field, uh, you just have to uh, think about what, what the meaning of this interaction would be in, in uh, high dimensional spaces. So in the simulations, we always used a single dimension really just for simplicity, but there is no fundamental difference in the dynamics. You can easily imagine how a kernel could be a neighborhood in a two-dimensional space or a three-dimensional space. And high-dimensional spaces are, of course, very practical. You know, I gave you this example of neural data where the retinal space was represented by a population of neurons and a peak is then localized in two dimensions. And we looked at it, how it evolves in time. <clears throat> These spaces can also be combined, uh, can represent along different axes, diff different qualities. We call those then feature maps. For instance, this is a uh, a figure from a, a paper by Dirk Janke done uh, early when we did this uh, population code I just showed you. In, in this paper, uh, he constructed representations that combined the orientation of a stimulus with the visual location of the stimulus. So this is a two-dimensional field, but it is not in a space that has direct physical meaning. It's a space that combines two very different kinds of uh, dimensions, orientation versus uh, spatial location. You could say that every spatial location along 1D, you record what orientation a stimulus, local orientation a stimulus has at that local uh, orientation because cells in the visual cortex uh, respond differently when you present objects of a different orientation. Uh, you can extract tuning curves with respect to orientation. Here are examples of such tuning curves. And, um, and then you can uh, construct uh, this two dimensional space. And that's something that we'll have a lot uh, in what comes that these spaces are higher dimensional. They are built from different um, underlying sp spaces that are combined into higher dimensional space. There's actually an issue in, uh, in the mathematics of that, you know, what the metrics of that is. You see, for instance, here that the uh, along this dimension, the, the units of degrees along that dimension, there would be actually in this case also visual degrees, but a different kind of degrees, right? right? Visual angle. Uh, in general, we're looking at, for instance, other features like color or size and so on. They have all different units. And so as a mathematical space, it's a little odd because uh, you would have a metric that has different units in different directions. And that means that it's actually not easy to represent them independent of a particular coordinate frame. So let's not worry about that for now. Uh, this can be sometimes an issue when you compare that to experiment. Um, but when I talk about high dimensional, I talk about combining dimensions that might be inherently quite different beasts over different spaces with different units, different physical spaces. And here's an example of a three dimensional field. Uh, as reported on the cortical surface, you know, when you when you uh, look at the cortical surface, the, these are actually two-dimensional layers of neurons, as I mentioned earlier. And so, within these two-dimensional sheets of neurons, you cannot actually represent a three-dimensional object in some spatially contiguous way. And what you actually find are these uh, maps. This is an orientation map. The different colors code for the different preferred orientation that is where the peak of the tuning curve is. And so as you go across visual cortex in two dimensions, you see that there is some kind of ordering where um, similar orientation preferences um, tends to be contiguous, that these neighboring locations tend to have the same orientation uh, specificity, but then it has to change, of course, and there are cuts there, some places where uh, 
for instance, along here, very different orientations meet. And what essentially happens is that the three-dimensional space is cut into a lot of two-dimensional slices, which are then somehow patched onto the cortical surface. So uh, that's just a practical problem the brain has to solve because it, it is physically built from two-dimensional sheets of neurons and to represent more than two dimensions, it has to you know, put different pieces onto its surface. And in, um, in a functional sense, this doesn't actually really matter because if you, matter, if you, match, uh, sorry, if you measure the uh, interaction function or some correlate of that uh, between, uh, for instance, uh, looking at really at correlation functions um, of neural activity, uh, then you find that uh, what determines how closely um, different subpopulations are coupled or correlated is how far they are in this third dimension of the orientation, not necessarily where that um, patch is on the cortical surface. And it makes sense if you think that the cortical surface uh, you know, decide, it's, it's actually only the, the, the network, the, the connectivity that represents what neighborhood really means. And so if you uh, make sure that at a, at a boundary, the corresponding uh, neighbors in orientation that are now put somewhere else um, are coupled excitatorily, then you essentially have represented the 3D field you know, in some complicated way on the 2D surface. So we don't go into this level of description, I'm just sort of pointing to you that the high dimensional fields we're talking about are not physically in the brain represented as high dimensional fields. They are cut up in pieces like that and can be distributed in quite complicated ways. And functionally, they are uh, three or higher dimensional spaces because the property of the kernel that neighbors excite and more distant locations inhibit that will then be true in three, four or more dimensions. So here's uh, just an illustration of <coughs> three dimensional fields. We sometimes actually use four dimensional fields that pretty much the highest we ever go. I don't have an illustration of that. So zero dimensional fields are actually nodes. Uh, that's what we started with, right? It will be just particular, um, you know, without any dimension, just a categorical representation of some underlying information and we, We'll see uses of that later. Uh, one dimension which you're familiar with, two dimension peaks, you know, can be illustrated this way with a color code for coding for uh, activation level. And uh, we will have a lot of three, these are three three dimensional fields. So we'll have a lot of these three dimensional fields in this little red bars symbolize where there would be peaks of activation. So it will be blobs of activation in 3D that correspond to peaks. Very typically we have two dimensions that correspond to um, visual space or some motor space or, or uh, some for instance, a touch surface and so, and so on. So these two dimensions are really spatial in this positional sense and the third is then a feature dimension. Sometimes we have two dimensional feature dimensions like size can be uh, for instance horizontal and vertical size and then we have a four dimensional space. And we sometimes call those feature uh, you know, feature space fields, and it means feature versus space, not, not feature space versus space, feature space fields. And we'll, we'll see a lot of examples of that. So uh, what I'm saying here, uh, first approximation is by just scaling the dimension, nothing special happens yet. If you, you can generalize the notion of localized input and of uh, locally excitatory, globally inhibitory kernels to higher dimensions, no problem. It's computationally a bit costly to simulate those fields, which reflects perhaps a problem the brain might have. And I will be talking about the scaling of certain properties with a number of dimensions in, in a little while. What I'm now interested in is to say that as we vary the dimensionality of a field, new cognitive functions become available. And I'm going to take you through two major uses of that that play a big role in all our higher cognitive modeling. One is called binding, and I'll explain what that is, and the other is coordinates form, that you already are somewhat familiar with from what I announced in the last lecture before Christmas, this vehicle example where we needed to transform information uh, from a retinal frame into a body-centered frame. Now let's first talk about binding. So here uh, is an example of a 
two-dimensional field that has that property that it binds or it connects two very different kinds of uh, uh, underlying dimensions. So one is the spatial location and the other is color here represented as the hue value. So um, it's a periodic space uh, where, where red here, then you know, red and red are connected here. Uh, and that is a possible representation of color along one line. I mean, this visual space is actually two-dimensional, but it's just for making the illustration nice. So we're really talking about a line along which there are colored objects. And so we're only keeping track of the horizontal position here in this, in this little scene. And so um, if you arrange things uh, appropriately, then a green object at this location will create a peak that is positioned along the horizontal at the position of this peak and along the vertical at the hue value of this peak. So this combines green with uh, that location and this combines blue with that location, right? And when I, these little arrows here that are supposed to be in 3D, they uh, hint that we could wire up the forward connectivity so that from that visual scene, uh, there would be localized input, localized in two dimensions at these two locations representing these two objects that at which there is some saturation, which is sort of the intensity of colored stuff, the saturation of these two uh, colored blobs uh, on a background, gray background that has no saturation. Now, uh, we, we, one could talk about that as being a joint representation of space and color. Uh, it's some form, other people say it's a bound representation uh, because you know where green is or you know where blue is. So the two aspects, the two feature dimensions of the objects here in this uh, play, their color and the location, they are represented together. And that is represented together really in the sense that the neurons or activation variables in this field um, represent every possible combination. Now, every color is combined with every spatial value. So if you activate a subpopulation, you know the combination of the two feature dimensions. And, and therefore, in some sense, the two values are bound to each other. So you can answer questions like, where is the green? Or, or what color is um, at this location? And I'll show you now how, how to operationalize that. I criticized that concept a little later, but that's what we'll start with. So uh, when you have represented you know, uh, joints, jointly features, so you have bound them, you can actually then very easily also extract the individual features. So it's not really unbinding them, it's just extracting the bound value. So for instance, when you have um, brought in these two-dimensional uh, peaks, uh, you could simply ask, uh, you know, extract the individual dimensions by marginalizing, that is, summing activation along the spatial axis eliminates the spatial dimension, the spatial location. Uh, you could sum and just take uh, the maximum or you could take some other kind of soft max and different ways of doing that, which uh, would lead to a peak that depends not only on the hue value, so only on the vertical dimension, uh, no longer on the horizontal dimension that would represent the color so for instance, in this situation, you would get a peak at green and a peak at blue, and you could answer questions about what colors are in the scene. And you could very similarly marginalize along color and uh, do that for all spatial locations. You would get a representation here that's purely spatial, and you would know where is there luminous stuff or, or saturated stuff in the scene, where there are you know, visible objects in the scene, the purely locations. So extracting, um, individual feature dimensions is just marginalizing. Marginalizing is the term from probability theory. If you have a probability density depends on multiple variables, you can sum over uh, any of those dimensions. And that, that means you marginalize, you, you eliminate the superfluous dimension and get the representation of the feature you're interested in. <clears throat> if you, you can do also the reverse. If you, if you know the individual unbound features, you can bind them. So for instance, here, you would know blue and you would know maybe this location and uh, that uh, could be inserted into the bound representation by ridge input. Uh, that's like a, a boost, but that's localized along one dimension. It's boost for all the neurons that are 
along the other dimensions, so all the activation variables. Uh, so if, if you combine these two, you can uh, uh, create an, a bound representation if you if tune the field so that it goes through detection instability only where these two boosts uh, overlap. So where they are, you know, like the threshold such that only if you add the two boosts, um, you can generate a peak and, and that will be at the intersection of these ridges. And uh, you know, that peak would then be the bound representation of these two items. You see uh, perhaps immediately a problem. If you were to bind multiple values, you get the so-called binding problem. The cognitive scientists call that the binding problem. That here, for instance, if you want to tell this field that there's a blue object and a green object, and one object is here, the other object is there. If you want to combine these two, you see there are four intersections of the ridges. And so you could create the correct peaks that you had in mind, these two here, but also um, what is sometimes called illusory conjunctions, that is combinations of the underlying feature values that you didn't intend to encode. Um, so that doesn't work. And the only way to make it work is to uh, bind each individual uh, project individually. So for instance, if you first uh, provide uh, the blue with the uh, with this location, you could build a peak here and you keep that in working memory by making a sustained peak. And then in the next spot, you could provide this and, and that uh, ridge and there would be only a peak here. And that way you could then drive this, you know, drive up these two peaks that you really meant. That will be a, a form of binding one object at a time, sequential binding. And that is what uh, psychophysical arguments have uh, and what's supported by psychophysics, where you look at how long it takes people to finish operations like that, and you see then that the time needed to do operations like that increases with the number of objects that you have to store or bind. And, um, and, and that is a hint at sequ sequentiality, that you're doing it one object at a time. And so that's the standard view that we're binding objects sequentially in time. That comes from that ambiguity that's evident in this picture. So uh, visual search is sort of an ingenious uh, combination of, of these things, of, of uh, using, a, of binding and then of extracting the bound feature dimension. So in visual search, you're providing rich input along one of multiple dimensions. So for instance, here you're saying, uh, I want the blue object and you're providing the, the, that information as a peak in a one-dimensional field that creates a ridge along the other dimension. But you're also having the localized, uh, the bound information because you're assuming from the visual array, you get this 2D input that uh, provides localized input at these two locations in the field. And now you, what you do is array, arrange for the detection instability to be at the level of um, uh, of input uh, that arises when the ridge is combined with the 2D input. So only this peak, which uh, this location, which uh, receives 2D input that overlaps with the ridge would be able to make a peak, while this 2D input would be insufficient to create a peak uh, because there's, there's no additional boost from a ridge. So if you do that, then this location and color bound combination will be represented as a peak. And you can then extract the feature dimension you're really interested in, which will be the location by projecting out into a purely spatial field, marginalizing the color field. <clears throat> so the task of visual search would be to say, where is the blue? You know, you're seeing this array and you're supposed to, for instance, look at that location or direct some action at the location and so on, <clears throat> or even just detect that there is such an object, a blue object. And that will be a possible operation for how to, to do that. <clears throat> that is uh, the core technique in all of the models that will be coming from now on. They all have a perceptual front end and at that perceptual front end, there is attention of selection of exactly that nature. So the attention selection consists of activating uh, a, a representation 
that includes the spatial location as an dimension. And in that representation, a peak would thus you know, um, re reflect the selective atten you know, attending to an object, a particular location selectively. And it will always be brought about by this kind of technology. And I'll show you some examples a little bit later. So very general value uh, or very general meaning in our theory because all the uh, work on, on cognition is, is actually all about applying something, some operator, some attention, some decision-making and so on to neural representations of objects in the world that are typically localized. And the first step will always be to bring about localized activation that represents the object. And it will be always through this kind of mechanism. <clears throat> so once you have that, you can, uh, again, uh, extract information about that object. So once you've induced that, you can then, let's say, if you knew the color, you can then say also its location. So if you go from one feature dimension to another and say, which, at which location is the blue, uh, what you're doing is you're combining a visual search with extraction of the corresponding feature. Huh? And similarly, you could say, which color is at that location? You, your answer is blue and that will be going in the opposite direction. <clears throat> and therefore, a lot of the connectivity in the architectures of this nature that we'll be looking at is bidirectional. That is, we allow a color peak to induce a, you know, a ridge um, that brings an object into the foreground, but we also allow a peak to be uh, marginalized to project onto, for instance, the spatial field, and the same for the shoe field. So that's the core mechanisms of binding in this conception. <clears throat> this conception is consistent with what um, uh, has been proposed as feature inter integration theory. Uh, it was originally uh, proposed by uh, Anne uh, um, Treisman, um, some other people, and um, the, actually, it's not really been, if you look back, feature integration theory as it was originally formulated, it, it was more of sort of a mix of algorithmic thinking. They were talking about feature files and neurophysiological thinking because they were thinking about tuning and feature dimensions. And so this account is actually the account that formalizes that intuition, makes it a, a neurally realistic or maybe somewhat realistic, neurally operational uh, theory. And we've published that in a couple of different uh, theory uh, papers. Uh, I wanted to uh, make a conceptual contrast with the form of binding that you're maybe more familiar with, which is typically thought of as association uh, that happens through synapses. So I'm illustrating if you, if you wanted to do the same thing in the more conventional sense, you would have a bunch of neurons that are coding for color, meaning that they have input from color that is localized. So for instance, that uh, the, this neuron gets very excited, I don't know if there's red and another neuron gets very excited if there's a blue element in its receptive field and so on. And then you would have some space encoding neurons that is this, you know, you know, it gets very excited when the stimulus is at a particular location and, and, and these here represent some neighboring location, right? These would be two one-dimensional fields. Uh, here as discrete neurons, because we'll be talking about uh, synaptic, uh, you know, connectionist kind of modeling. Now, if you want to bind these two together, the natural idea would be to say, I will do that by heavy and learning. That is when these neurons fire, these neurons will also fire because they're driven by the same object, the object that is at that location and has this color. So if fire together, Y together applies, then uh, any synaptic connectivity that is potentially contained in a model like that would you know, be driven for, away from zero strength by this co-occurrence of activation. So heavy and learning would lead the, these neurons to be connected to each other. So then you would actually have a function of association. You could, for instance, provide the color cue and then it would, through this connectivity, excite you know, somewhat the uh, you know, position along the spatial dimension of this other set of neurons and vice versa. Now, of course, if you, if you have uh, 
uh, so it's just an explanation of that. <clears throat> so if you have that, uh, you still have a binding problem in some sense in that if you uh, now were to uh, want to learn the association between left and red and maybe this one on the right and blue, you get uh, potential misassociations where the fact that these neurons fire at the same time as these neurons would also lead their connection to be strengthened. And similarly, you know, the connection between this location and that uh, color would also be strengthened, even though they were not intended to. So that would be, a, in some sense, a illusory conjunction or a misbinding problem. And maybe what you see now is that it is analogous to the binding problem. It is something that is avoided in connectionist networks simply by learning one object at a time. Now in in, in uh, this aspect of cognition, real-time cognition, we are thinking of binding not as involving learning, but as being real-time processing. You see for the first time your desk and you know where the red is on the desk and you can store that in working memory by keeping a peak uh, active, you know, sustained activation. But if you... Um, if you use heading and learning, what you would be doing is learning properties. It would be associative properties. For instance, you could learn that, I don't know, that this object you know, has a white uh, cover and you know, some shape. And so you associate, let's say, the shape with the color. And uh, in, in heading and learning, you would do that by uh, connecting up the units uh, so that when you give the shape, then you can predict the color and so, and so on, right? And so what you maybe recognize is that this form of connections learning also always works one optic at a time. And in all of the connections networks, you're um, actually showing the system only one meaningful item that it is supposed to associate with something else or it is supposed to associate uh, the different um, detailed feature values of the object with each other in, in a form of uh, homo association. Um, and, and you do that one object at a time. If you have multiple objects in there, it's going to be create these misbindings and that is usually treated as um, just a source of unlearning. So the reason why you have to present the object many times is that you uh, wanna make sure that the only thing that is consistently associated across different uh, subpopulations is our properties from the object that you're showing. So only one of those connections will really persist while the others will be randomly varying when you show the object in different locations, different orientations and so on, they will be washing out uh, by becoming homogeneous um, so that only the significant associations stay. So the binding problem is actually uh, present. You know, just think back about all the connections networks you ever looked at, they learn one concept or item or whatever it is they learn at a time. They don't simultaneously learn two different qualitatively different uh, concepts or objects. So it's an important general problem. So certainly this uh, <clears throat> uh, synaptic binding doesn't solve the binding problem. It is, it's a more rigid solution to that. And the, the one I was talking about does that in real time going to this uh, on the first exposure. Now, the downside of that is, of course, it is very costly. Uh, it's, see, here you only need as many neurons as you in the lowest dimensional space, you know, a bunch of neurons for left and right, and here a bunch of neurons for different colors. Well, here you need a neuron for every combination of values. So that's a lot of neurons. You could say this is some form of neuroanatomical binding that is by having enough neurons that represent all the possible combinations. So it's kind of cheap in a sense. A cheap idea, but costly in terms of neurons. For instance, uh, let's say you want to bind orientation, color, texture, scale, and two-dimensional visual space. So I arrange for that to be uh, six uh, dimensions, you know, four feature dimensions and two visual space dimensions. So you get a six-dimensional field. And if you now think that per dimension you only need a hundred neurons then you already have 10 to the power of 12 neurons. And I chose these uh, examples too, because that's pretty much the number of neurons estimated to be in your entire brain. If you don't take the um, cerebellum into account, that is actually a pretty good um, estimate. So that's very costly, right? That will be your entire brain just supporting one little thing like that. So 
that can't really be the answer. I, I sketch what the answer is, and there is some good evidence that something in that direction is true. That's the, the original uh, Treisman idea, actually, binding through space. <clears throat> uh, and I'll illustrate that by talking about a, a, a few uh, lower dimensional representations that then functionally act like they can bind more dimensions to each other. So here you have color orientation and size. There's three feature dimensions and each feature dimension is uh, defined over uh, retinal space here, horizontal uh, X, Y retinal space. And so each is a three dimensional field. Uh, so each uh, field binds space to one dimension. It's actually two dimension here, the visual space. Uh, so it's one set of dimensions. Um, and that set of dimensions, the visual space uh, that the features bond to, that is the same for all different feature dimensions. So that's the shared dimension they all share. And if you do that, you can bind through space in this uh, sense that you would um, provide some information about a spatial location. That will be, uh, for instance, uh, here the cylinder. Now, if you know where you're looking, then you activate all the locations uh, that are uh, you know, share that spatial dimension. And that will bring into the foreground and you know, activate any peaks uh, from two dimension or from high dimensional uh, input in these fields that are uh, you know, at that spatial location. And um, you could read out the information uh, along the feature dimension uh, by just project marginalizing the visual space and then insert that into another field that will be a field that, you know, where, where you're only uh, providing the feature value. So it's, it will be a, a slice rather than a ridge in two dimensions, a slice and a slice. So uh, in each case, you've extracted the feature value and you can insert it in somewhere else. And now you could uh, you know, position the peak at the same or a corresponding location by just uh, supplying uh, the localized dimension along the third dimension, which is again the cylinder and at, at the intersections of these uh, slices with the cylinders, you would induce the objects, right? So that's how you would, um, I mean, first of all, for every individual field, this is just the transfer from uh, the uh, unbound to the bound representation. So here it's bound, right? Because now in 3D, you have this localized information. Um, but what it also does, it, it can also do this across space. And here's an illustration of that. Uh, let's say I here I've just um, used two-dimensional spatial location along the horizontal, and you here is color, and the shape of the ladder is just some arbitrary dimension, of which these shapes are different. And so here the, the notion would be that your challenge system, for instance, that you're looking for green, and you're, you know, that there will be a ridge along uh, space localized at green, that the, these uh, five localized input are the five letters in the visual array. So that would be uh, bringing out a particular location at which the uh, ridge at green overlaps with the two dimensional input. And you would read that out where that location is and you can put it back into the uh, other field by uh, a vertical slice that now would activate the particular uh, uh, shape value that you have here, this uh, shape value, and that uh, you know, reads out here at, at the location in shape space where S relies. And thus you have used the spatial location to bind the um, color feature value to the space feature value by in the sense of being able, you know, given the color, you can answer what the space is. And so this is not based, as I previously showed, uh, you know, in the previous example, this was based on uh, representing all combinations of colors and shapes and space. And this is um, actually having separate representations for color and shape, but a shared dimension of these two representations, which is visual space. So that's how binding across space works. And so this account, uh, uh, this, this idea accounts for classical, a lot of classical data about uh, visual working memory. Here's an example of that. Um, so for instance, uh, you have a visual array of this nature uh, 
where there's orientation and color that are bound. So you have an orientation space field and a color space, uh, sorry, color phase space field and a orientation space field. So here's orientation, different orientations make uh, peaks at the retinal locations that where, the, where that orientation is seen and similar for the color. And uh, now the uh, color and orientation are bound through space in the sense that they have that shared um, spatial location because the object is always localized, the object which has these, in which these two features are bound. And you can actually use the same technique that I was just hinting at. If you intentionally select an individual object, you can uh, boost, sorry, boost this representation to extract the feature value that's stored here. This would be red. And this would be, you know, the somewhat almost horizontal orientation here and provide input to a new field that has information about the location and these feature values at the intersection, the peak arises. And in this case, this is a field that has a single peak. This is a multi-peak version. So it has uh, sustained activation. Do a one-to-one -one transfer to that. That would be your memory of that particular object. And that's bound in the sense that through space, you know that these are corresponding spatial locations that will become active uh, if you just boost the spatial location from one of those objects. And you can do that for the second object and for the third. And you see that as you're reading this into the, uh, into this uh, me working memory representation, uh, you can see the binding problem in the background. That is, if you just were to go by the ridges, you know, there are other possible bindings that would be, um, you know, alternative illusion conjunctions, and these will not happen because of the activation along space. So as you're, uh, as you're entering an item, uh, the peak will be aligned in one of those fields with the peaks in the other field because of the shared spatial di dimension. That uh, fishes out the matching peak from the all, all the possible peaks. Now, the particular reason why we doing this in this complicated way is not just this economics that we don't want to have high dimensional fields that represent everything at the same time. It's actually also a particular feature that we're thinking of coordinate transform acting that way. So coordinate transform would mean, for instance, that the level at which you're storing your visual memory about a scene, for instance, about that scene would be not your retinal uh, level. You know, so the retinal input will be shifting as you you shift your gaze in the scene looking at these different objects, there will be always a different retinal representation. And that's not what you want to commit to working memory because you want to maybe be able to look back at the object or to handle the object, irrespective of how you looked at it, at it, at it when you first learned about it. Um, and, and this framework makes that very easy to conceive of because what you could do is simply uh, do a purely spatial coordinate transform, and I'll show you in a moment how that works, uh, that uh, transforms this representation that will be in retinal space here to this representation that will be in some kind of scene um, reference frame, you know, something absolute in the scene. And all you would have to know, know is how a peak here in, in retinal space corresponds to a peak in anocentric space. And now here in this illustration, it's always in the same location. That is, in this location in eurocentric sp space corresponds to the same retinal space. But there could be some offset between those if you shift your gaze. Um, and if you do that, then this model will allow you to, um, to store the object at the new spatial location that you computed uh, without having to transform the entire uh, spatial array. All you have to do is extract the feature value put that as a ridge into the system here at the new location. And you will see in a moment that, that we can quite reasonably build uh, spatial machines that make the spatial coordinates swarm. And then we don't have to do the same for all the feature values. So that's binding through space. Good. Um, do you have any questions about that? Now is a good time to ask it. And the second, and you will see related feature that we get from high dimensional fields are coordinate transforms. I already uh, talked about coordinate transform in this 
Mordal lecture, the last lecture of, uh, of the previous year, in which I pointed out that this robot vehicle might want to keep its working memory in a reference frame that is anchored to the world because that's where objects tend to not move. While it isn't so convenient to do that in a retinal frame or a frame that's uh, rotates with the vehicle in this first vehicle example, because uh, in that frame, um, uh, objects are not invariant and uh, it would be stupid to have a working memory of something that actually then loses meaning when you rotate on the spot, for instance, or if you shift your eyes. So the transformation of information to reference frames that appropriately capture the level at which these objects remain constant or invariant uh, is, is important if we want to build working memories and thus <clears throat> representations without input, which is what this all cognition is based on. Um, and so the most intuitive example might be the retina, and I'll use that example. This is from Sebastian Schneegans' um, chapter in the book. It was a, a student of mine who did his doctoral thesis on project on, on the properties of these coordinate transforms. And so in, in, the, in this uh, transformation from retinal to something like body-centered or scene-centered, um, you see that you know, if this is your eye, <laughs> as a character of your eye looking at this visual array, then if you're fixating on the red object, then this one shows up on the right of the left one in retinal coordinates. And uh, if you're now shifting your gaze to the green object on the right, the green is at the center, and then the red is here to the left of that. So this would be your retinal image under one condition. This would be your retinal image under another condition. So these retinal images are, of course, not the same. They are not invariant. And so the question is, how can you present the scene independent of your gaze, which is what you want to do? If you want to use this information about the scene, given that you have made various kinds of eye movements, and, and now you want to refer back to the object without having to, having to look exactly at the location at which you first saw the object. That is a problem that's very general. It shows up everywhere across uh, the nervous system. So here's an example of, of why you want to do that. Uh, for instance, the, the object is grasped by your arm and your arm is attached to your shoulder, not to your head. So if you, or not to your eye. So if you uh, were to represent it only in retinal coordinates, you would always have to do that coordinate distance form. You could also try to do it the other way around to represent where on your retinal frame the hand is, is thinkable. But the variant that I'll uh, pursue is that you represent the object in terms of where it is relative to your body, which would be a scene frame. And it shows up within movement. For instance, when you have this kind of visual uh, representation and now you want to grasp this object with this hand, you have to move your hand in this direction with this much. And extracting these movement parameters, like movement extent and movement direction, amounts to a coordinate transform. It amounts to representing the visual array here, this object, in a frame that is centered at the initial position of the hand. If you have that, you can read off the extent simply as the radius or distance from the origin of the object in the direction now already from some reference. Uh, axis <clears throat> as the angular representation of the location of this object in the hand-centered representation. And there's actually some recent neural data that's not yet complete as far as I know that shows that there are neurons in parietal cortex that have exactly this property that re represent uh, objects in terms of the initial position of the hand. Uh, they use the gain field property to characterize the neurons as doing that. This gain field property comes from uh, the dependence of the size of the receptive field on that third variable your gaze. And I'll explain in a moment, not exactly that, but, but how that third variable comes in. <clears throat> and I think I have one more example just to show that coordinate transforms also show up in more abstract ways. So for instance, if you look at this little, little uh, visual array and you wanna talk about it with relational terms, for instance, you say the vertical object is to the left of the horizontal object. Uh, the vertical is to the left of the horizontal, right? The target, we call this the target object in this phrase, in this reference object. Um, so to actually, oh, there I have uh, all text in here. This 
is from when I used this at Cogsai, where we had a whole tutorial about that. Now I don't. Huh? Um, so uh, we the, so so. Why does that show up here? Well, it shows up because you might have a simple neural operator for a concept like left. This, so relational concept, right? Left, left off. And uh, you could think of that as a node, the node for to the left of, a node for the right of maybe. And it would be operational by having some connectivity that is excitatory to the left of some visual array and not to the right of the visual array. And, and you know, the node for right off would have excitatory connectivity to the right of the array, not to the left of the array. Now for that to, to work flexible, flexibly, when you're talking about different parts of the visual array, you would have to be sure that you can apply this pattern of connectivity to reference objects at different locations in the array. And so what you need to do is you need to represent the target centered on the reference. And if you have that, then in that representation, you can be sure that, now it will be, for instance, here, uh, th this will be the center where the object is. Then you can be sure that the peak always arises at the same location, it's invariant, because when you move around the reference, the target that, that's to the left of the reference is always at the same location in the field that is centered on the reference object. And that turns out to be the same kind of problem of chance coordinates in form that you have originally some fixed space and now you're representing the space as centered in a particular location, namely the reference, the location of the reference object. So, so that's what co coordinate transforms do. <clears throat> Mathematically, they are really just mappings between two reference frames. You have, let's say in the retina uh, case, a retina-centric reference frame that moves with the eye and you have a body centered frame that is invariant under movement of the eye. And the mapping between those is, turns out it's just a shift operation, right? It's something that uh, where you need to take your gaze shift and add that gaze shift to the current um, you know, retinal information then you get the body centered representation approximately. But the important thing about that is that it's a function of these two variables. That is, if you know the retinal uh, coordinates and you know where you're looking, where your eye is in the head or, on, or relative to your body, then you can compute where the object is relative to your body. And in, in terms of you know, good approximation, it's a linear mapping. It's in actually, it's more complicated. It can have some sign as a cosine function because it depends on the angles. But in the first approximation, it's just a linear function adding the retinal input to the gaze angle. So that's uh, uh, very simple. And in the robot example, I hinted that we just implemented that function. We just shifted. We took the heading direction of the robot that corresponds to the gaze angle and put the uh, sensed position on in robot coordinates, um, and added the current heading direction, and then we obtained the position or heading of that object in the world frame. But Neurally, it's not so easy how to do that. Neurons actually don't really implement um, function calls like that, right? That's information processing. You give an input, you get an output. Neurons have some pattern of connectivity. So what pattern of connectivity could bring about such a function call? And that turns out to be a little more complicated than you first might imagine. The reason for that is that we're, you know, neural networks are very good at fixed mapping. That is taking a neural uh, population connecting it to some other population to project in a particular way. Let's say this is one population and you uh, map it onto some other population by you know, shifting all the activation a little bit to the right. So that's what maps are very good at. But now we're talking about a map where the nature of this map depends on a third variable. So here you would have the thing you want to transfer. Let's say the, the uh, position of the hand, uh, the uh, gaze angle and you want, uh, no, so, so it's actually the other one, the, the position of the reference object, the gaze angle, and then you would uh, want to get out the um, hand position. I'm, I'm mixing metaphors here, sorry. <laughs> so it's a, a, a third, a three things, right? Retina position, gaze angle, and body position, or it was uh, you know, the same with respect to initial position of the hand uh, and um, 
object in the scene versus object center in the head. And so the answer is you need a bound representation of two of those angles, and then you can extract the third. So for instance, uh, in this representation, every combination of a retinal location and a particular gaze angle is represented by neurons. Also this particular uh, subpopulation represents objects at this retinal location when the gaze angle is here. So when you have that, then you can run the projection from here to a representation uh, based on uh, body space as a one-to-one -one mapping that would read out th that location. Um, and and, and uh, the binding, uh, we know how it works. The binding works by putting ridges into this uh, representation. So the uh, steering, uh, the gaze angle would uh, erect a ridge along the retinal space, the retinal space erects a ridge along gaze angle and where they meet, we have the boundary representation. And extraction is just marginalizing. We just have to find out along which line we're marginalizing. That will be the function. If it's just a sum, if you think through it, it's actually along the diagonal. I'll show you that in a moment. But you could have some fancy function that will be just some complicated line in that subspace. And that would be able to extract any function of these two, or any smooth function of these two underlying angles. So let's go through this example to make this uh, more down to earth. And you will see how this uh, mapping uh, emerges pretty much. So here, what I'm plotting on the left is the bound representation of retinal space and the gaze angle. The gaze angle is, is represented relative to something like the body. I'm, I'm here not actually talking about the head, but talking about the body with the idea that doesn't matter if you're moving your eyes within your head or moving your head. That actually turns out to be biologically true. A lot of the experiments on these sort of things done neurally are done with monkeys whose head was fixed, actually screwed, that little mount on the head when you record from neurons, you, you put a little cement, a little bit uh, the platform onto the head so that the electrodes don't move. And then you fix the head by you know, screwing that making a fixation between this uh, chamber and um, you know, the seat that the monkey is positioned in. This was so that the electrodes don't move. And uh, then the monkeys are using their eyes to look at the different objects. Um, but when you let the monkeys move their head, which has become now possible that electrodes have become lighter and they are not shifting as much when the monkey uh, moves the head, then it turns out that the data align best when you actually plot everything in terms of gaze angle. That is where the eye is pointing relative to the body. And the, uh, the, you can achieve that gaze angle by moving the eye a little bit more or moving the head a little bit more. There's some kind of trade-off between those. In fact, there's a, the uh, oculomotor reflex that makes that when you're shifting your head, you're moving your eyes to keep gaze constant. So the gaze is really the right uh, concept. That's why I'm using this body-centered representation. So let's say you're looking ahead, your gaze is here at zero. So gaze angle here at zero, this location. And your visual system is a little bit to the right so that on your retina, it's at 10 degrees, a little bit to the right, you know, 10 degrees, a little bit to the right. So where these two meet, there is a combined representation of gaze angle and stimulus, uh, the retina stimulus. And at that location, uh, relative to the body, it's also at 10 degrees because you know that's where your body is. So and, um, I didn't put, put that in here. Now, uh, it's always the same. It's always the same relative to the body. You know, I'll, I'll keep the same. Now, if you're shifting your gaze to look at the object, your gaze angle is now 10 degrees because that's where you're looking. It's still, still in the same location. And in, in retinal terms, it's now at zero. Degrees. So you have zero here, 10 degree here. So if this was where you pre previously was, it moved up here to this new combination of values. Here's another combination. You shift your gaze here to negative 20. Your visual stimulus is now on the retina at plus 30. It was plus 10, now it's plus 30. And it's still the same in body forwardness. And that turns out to be here, now minus 20 plus 30. It's, it's this, so now you see, it's on this line that the invariant uh, 
body-centered representation lies. So the, in other words, all the peaks along this line share the same orientation of the stimulus relative to your body in the same body-centered coordinate. And, and if you shift this line along the vertical, <clears throat> so uh, you know, or along the diagonal, then you're spanning different stimulus uh, representations in the body-centered frame. So this is the correct uh, picture. It is <clears throat> as you vary the body spatial position by moving this to different places, you're uh, summing input along different lines. So summing input along that line leads to one particular body centered position or will be capturing the invariant body centered position of all the objects, uh, or, you know, of all the inputs that are derived when you vary gaze and the retinal field covaries, and then you have a neighboring location and the neighboring location will be summing along that neighboring diagonal to extract the body center position of that object. You can do this also in the reverse. Uh, that is, you once you have that position, uh, you can, uh, you know, the op opposite of marginalizing, you know, this is marginalizing, you're summing along all these potential positions so that you're getting rid of the particular combination of retinal location and gaze angle that gave rise to that object. You can also do the reverse. That is, once you know the position relative to the body, you activate all the locations at which this uh, object occurs and uh, all the combinations of gaze angle are in the field. Now you might have one of these two dimensions uh, specified. For instance, you maybe know your gaze angle and then a peak emerges here where these two intersect and you can extract where on the retina the stimulus should show up. Uh, or you could uh, you know, have some visual input and um, then use that to predict your gaze. I must be looking this direction because the thing that is on my body here shows up there. And that's how you could sort of estimate your gaze angle and calibrate your motor system that actually has to predict the gaze angle. Here's an example from the thesis work of uh, Sebastian Sch Schneegans, uh, where he showed that a system like that can be used to predict the retinal image, image for a memorized scene. So that just exploits this projection with this peak where they overlap you and use peaks and you predict the retinal field. Um, and uh, here, here's an example of how that would operate. Let's say initially you have some, there, there are two, uh, your retinal representations now, there's the one that you really get from the from your sensor, the input, and this is the red one is what you predict, where you expect that input. So here, for instance, when you initially have some input at that location, while you're gazing here, a peak forms, you're building a peak over time at the body centered location of that. If then you are removing the stimulus you're predicting by this reverse projection, predicting that this is the location where that stimulus was originally presented. Now, if you make a gaze shift after the stimulus has been off, gaze shift meaning you know, this peak shifts from here to here. Now, uh, under the influence of, in, and this is in working memory, you, you, you've stored where the object was in the world. The, uh, the memory peak will uh, you know, create input along this uh, diagonal and where the interlap overlaps with the newly predicted uh, you know, gaze or the, the, the anticipated gaze angle, a peak will form and that peak is projected onto uh, the retinal output uh, predicting the location of that peak, the location of, you know, of that object when it comes back on. So here's a uh, computer simulation of just that, you know, induced the field. Uh, now make a gaze, you know, have body center representation, gaze shift. And you see now the prediction arises at these locations while this lower level here was invariant, right? You know, see again, so they see it's invariant here on the horizontal axis. I was going to point with my hand at the computer screen, which isn't particularly useful, of course. Okay. That's prediction. That turns out to be something that really happens in biology. This is um, data from IT uh, from 
a famous group, and every time I lecture about that, I forget the name of that group. We need to put that into my slides. Um, I can blank on the name of the group who did that. So what they had is they observed uh, neurons that have particular receptive fields. This would be the receptive field of a neuron such that when the monkey is fixating at that location and the stimulus falls into that location, the neuron fires. You see the fire of the neuron here. When, while the stimulus is present, it fires. When the stimulus is turned off, but the monkey is still fixating here, it fires in a sustained way. It actually sort of slowly fades, but certainly for much longer than if, um, you know, for instance, um, than if the, um, well, well, we'll get to that. <laughs> now, uh, here's another reason why the neuron may stop firing or, or, or you know, why, why it would be challenged. And, and this is uh, initially fixating here. The stimulus was shown in the receptive field since they had that receptive field, but then the uh, monkey was motivated to make an eye movement. See the horizontal position changes here to this new fixation location. So this is where its receptive field falls now. And under these conditions, the neuron really kills the activation. So it ramps down and no longer is activated. And uh, now the, the astounding part of this experiment is that when you're initially asked the monkey to fixate here, you don't show him it, the, it anything. And you uh, briefly show the stimulus at the original location. This only very briefly here. Um, but it falls outside the receptive field that the monkey, the uh, neuron has under these conditions when it's fixated it's here, right? It, it, uh, only after the gaze shift will the, this fall into its receptive field. But what you see, what is happening that, so what, once the eye has shifted to the new location, the stimulus has been off. There is no longer stimulus at the new location, but still the cell fires. So it looks like the cell is predicting that it should be receiving input um, after it has made the gaze shift. Uh, but it doesn't actually get that input and that's why the firing is, uh, you know, decreases quickly. These uh, effects are modeled by this model. That, so the bottom row is our model of the data in the top. And so uh, captures this correctly. So this is a proposal for how such uh, you know, prediction could happen. It's not from the retinal input that the neuron fires, but from the retinal input that is predicted by the core emissions form. Um, yeah, and the last version of this is that you could use a match with your visual scene to estimate your gaze. So if you know a whole visual scene and you've stored the visual scene in work memory, you could combine these two and where they combine well, that will be the gaze angle that you think is the most likely carry that you have. Oh no, not for details of that. Okay, so that's how coordinate transforms could be done with these two things. Now, of course, you, you have to recognize really that the, uh, the this is a simplification, right? The retinal field is one dimensional, the gaze field is one dimensional, and the body center field is uh, one dimensional. And, uh, and so in reality, they have to, all of those are four dimen uh, two dimensional. And so the uh, transformation field has to be four dimensional, right? So uh, again, 1D make that 2D, another 1D make that 2D. So this is 4D, now combines, binds together two dimensional space to another two dimensional space. So this is a 4D field. It can be illustrated by having a, a two dimensional array of two dimensional arrays. So each little uh, tile of this picture is in itself a two-dimensional array. So if you have this uh, retinal field and this gain gaze field combination, you want to transform it into a body-centered frame. In this form, it turns out that that is the four-dimensional representation of that little scene. And you can go through <clears throat> all these different operations. So that illustrates also the costliness of that. So what you do to uh, transform, you have a joint representation of the steering dimension and the transformed space. So for instance, also for the hand, uh, 
cord is transformed in the center of the hand. The hand would be perhaps in two dimensions if it's over a table, it would be perhaps in three dimensions if it's in particular location in space. And now you have to represent the, uh, you know, the uh, visual array, which could be a three dimensional array uh, for reaching centered in the initial position of the hand, that's a three-dimensional one. And you would get a, in that case, a six-dimensional representation. Here it was four-dimensional. And you still have to, uh, so, so, so that's you know, quite a number of uh, dimensions. As I said earlier, six-dimensional already might easily cost you the whole brain. Four-dimension maybe doesn't cost you the whole brain, but it's still quite a lot. If you now add dimensions, you know, if you wanted to have uh, color at that location, uh, direction at that location, and so on, you can see that that would add to these dimensions. And then quickly, this intermediate field would have a very high dimensionality. So what we're postulating is that this is what typically happens, that is two by two, make, leading to four dimensional. So even what I was thinking at by three by three might not be so typical because requires a lot of neurons. The one structure in the brain that has an astoundingly large number of neurons is the cerebellum, the Kleinhirn in German, which is in, engaged in sensory motor and even more cognitive fine tuning of mappings. And it's quite possible that it does something like that, some, some form of transform. It might be a transform also through time that you can look at what a future, what the future will bring given my current present. And you have to do that with different presents. Um, and, uh, and, and it would have that large number of neurons because it needs to sample uh, a space with uh, a reasonable number of dimensions. It's not, there are some proposals like that for the cerebrum. It's not entirely clear that that, that is how it works, but you certainly can see that the uh, coordinates form is a real, um, comes with uh, competition cost and you could think of it as a bottleneck. So if you, if you don't make the transform for all the feature dimensions at the same time, you, so you present them separately, uh, you can still transform the whole scene by binding through space. Huh? You, because as I showed you, you can now say, where is this piece of space going? And then you combine again the feature values by saying, at this location, I have this color, this orientation, and so on. Um, so in that abstract sense, the coordinates form would actually ultimately be the reason for this sequentiality bottleneck. So we have to bind stuff from the unbound components during the coordinates transform. And that is the scientific hypothesis that we're proposing in our current research work. Okay, so I, I didn't want to take it further than this in, in today's lecture, uh, just to say that High dimensional uh, fields enable new cognitive functions like binding, attention selection, matching, visual search, and coordinates form. In the next couple of lectures, you will be seeing how we make that work, solve problems for us. Uh, problems like, um, like the grounding of concepts and uh, establishment of analogies and things like that. These require that the operations, including the coordinate forms, uh, uh, occur autonomously, that is not driven by input, but by, by internal states. And I will have to address sequence generation. And that will be one of the next uh, lectures to talk about how sequences of, of events arise autonomously in uh, neurodynamic architectures. <laughs>